And um, welcome to this conversation about the opportunities and the challenges thrown up by new technologies, um, both around the world and, of course, here in India. Um, we've got a fantastic and, I should say, eminent panel with us to walk us through this fourth industrial revolution as it's come to be known. Um, let me quickly start by introducing everyone before I get to the topic. Um, to my right, you've got the Minister for Railways for India, Suresh Prabhu. Uh, and I'm hoping to talk to him a bit about how the government is factoring in new technologies, what challenges it sees, and what opportunities it sees, um, in his department especially, railways. Uh, John Rice, to my left, uh, is from GE, which has a long and deepening relationship with India, um, especially in the railway sector, and we'll talk a little bit about that, how that's going, how new technologies are being factored into the new manufacturing units they're setting up in states like Bihar. Um, to the left of John, uh, we've got Pranay from Ola Cabs, who's going to talk to us about, I hope, about the new platforms, the new technology platforms that are coming into the country, uh, the opportunities they present, um, and the challenges they face as they try and enter new industries and new sectors in, in India. And then we've got Landon Downs, who's going to talk to us about one of the most cutting-edge new technologies uh, that I'm not sure I fully understand, so I'm hoping he'll explain to us quantum computing. He's from 1QB Technologies in Canada. Uh, and he's going to tell us about what it is, uh, what it can do for us, and what it can do here in India. Um, so so let's, let's just start by talking a little bit about what this is, what the fourth industrial revolution is. I'm going to quote something that Klaus Schwab wrote uh, introducing the subject um, in, his, in his book, which I think all of you have. Um, he says, referring to diverse technologies like AI, robotics, and quantum computing, he said something that I think perfectly frames the conversation for us this morning. He says, of the many diverse and fascinating challenges we face today, the most intense and important is how to understand and shape the new technology revolution, which entails nothing less than a transformation of humankind. We are at the beginning of a revolution that is fundamentally changing the way we live, work, and relate to one another. In its scale, scope, and complexity, what I consider, what he considers, to be the fourth industrial revolution is unlike anything humankind has experienced before. So I think that, that sets us up pretty well for a conversation. And now we're going to have a little video, I think, to, to illuminate the subject a little bit more, and then we'll get to our conversation. The original industrial revolution was driven by the discovery that you could use steam engines to do all kinds of interesting things. That was followed by additional revolutions for electricity and computers and communications technology. We're now in the early stages of the fourth industrial revolution, which is bringing together digital, physical, and biological systems. One of the features of this fourth industrial revolution is that it doesn't change what we are doing but it changes us. We need a different economic model that will allow us to meet the basic needs of every human on the planet and that will be focused not on growth per se, but on maximizing human well-being. We have energy technologies that can power our civilization, but how do we get it and implement it at the scale we need at a price that people around the world can afford? If we're able to do something to transform cities, to make them more efficient, then the impact can be huge. We can use asset tracking, we can use IT, we can use 3D printing to decouple growth from the resource constraints we have. The question of adding quality to quantity, it's really about a diverse, safe, healthy and just world with clean air, clean water, clean energy. Together we are fighting to preserve our fragile climate from irreversible damage and devastation of unthinkable proportions. The prediction of 5 million jobs lost by 2020 to technology is serious, but the main question is how will we define work? How will we share the wealth? How can you have a doctor that really knows a lot about data? How can you have a biologist that knows about medicine? We have to create a space that enables people to think freely, to think divergent thoughts, to think creative thoughts. We really need a new education. With new training. We're working with a world in motion in FIRST Robotics, trying to encourage students from third grade all the way up through the end of high school to pursue science, math, and different technologies. It's this ability of digital technology to change outcomes, to truly empower people that can create a more equitable growth. Fourth Industrial Revolution has the potential to make 
inequalities visible and to make them less acceptable in the future. I was the first person in the world to be able to voluntarily move my legs while stepping in a robot. The cure will be possible if enough of the right people have the will to make it happen. We're seeing this incredibly exciting convergence of genome editing, DNA sequencing. Governments have a very important role to play in enabling the safe and effective use of technologies. We need to take responsibility at every level of society to adapt to these technological challenges which are redefining what it means to be completely embedded in this world. Even though we have everyday problems we have to solve, we have to find a way to lay the foundations for the innovations of tomorrow. Um, great, so broad topic. Um, let's start with you, Minister. Um, so of all the new technologies that are coming in, in your, in, as you frame rail policy for the years ahead, railways are so important both for the transport of people and goods in India. What are the things that are most exciting you? What new technologies are most animating policy making in your sector as you think about it in the years ahead? No, let me, first of all, preface my remark by saying that this is not something we are talking about a fourth industrial revolution. Obviously, there have been three before, we I presume. But there were even far more before, not necessarily in the industrial sector. But ever since human being is born, he has used technology as a tool to better his life. So he has been doing many things, even including Stone Age. There was a technology. So it's not that industrial revolution is the beginning of technology. So technology has always been there. We may not have called it by that name. And this may not have resulted into industrialization, but the human beings have always used tools to better the life, to find out better avenues for growth, and that's how it has been there. Now the challenge is uh, obviously the first few industrial revolution that we have seen is its adverse consequences on something which we never imagined will really happen, particularly on the environment. We never realize what would be the consequence of that. The second aspect of testing a technology, how far is it relevant and what we should be doing, is its impact on society. Because that again is something which we try to overlook. And therefore, something which is not sustainable, not only in terms of the sustainability, which we normally attribute only to environment, it is also something which society is willing to accept and actually better their life and does not really create any issues. And we have seen that in many cases. Even on environment space alone, if you talk about, we were trying to address the challenge of, uh, um, we wanted to get rid of uh, ozone layer depletion, ODS. And therefore, we created the gas which caused greenhouse gas emission. And therefore, now we had to find out a solution to other issues. So we created, a, we solved a problem, created another problem. So in that context, what we really need is of technology, no doubt about it. We cannot, no one can stop it. This is something which is inevitably going to happen because that also is an invention happens in the human mind first. So human beings want it, it's going to happen. Only thing is that we must have as a broader space to find out it's these two fundamental issues, environment and society, how they will be compatible. Now in Indian context, we are always open for new technologies and therefore in fact that's how India was the largest economy of the world some centuries ago. And that's only because we embrace new ideas, new technology. The ideas is the technology also. So we really need to do that and we'll continue to do that. Now, just talking about contemporary issues of, I think I should not be saying something when John is here because he he's the technologist, I'm not a technologist. <laughs> so I think using transportation is going to be the major, in my opinion, the next big thing that's going to happen is in the transportation sector. People who like to move from one place to another, we just had a meeting in Delhi on 2nd of September. We got six top global companies to come and talk about transportation technologies which we'll use in India. Develop in India, co-develop, mm -hmm. then manufacture in India, and then of course use in India, and then maybe use outside the country. But that is something which I think is going to be revolutionizing mm -hmm. the entire thing. For example, Hyperloop. We cannot even imagine what's going to happen we, as we say the brick and mortar. So talking about my own sector, tracks and rolling stock will become irrelevant. And that's how it's going to happen. So it's just imagination, which is the only limit for technology development. It, if human minds can reach there, obviously it reaches there first. Obviously that's a technology that's going to happen. So my imagination 
is limited. That's why my technology development is limited. Mm -hmm. If I open up my mind and open it to new ideas, the technology development has infinite possibilities. So that's what we are willing to do it. And one area in which prime minister of a country is fully gearing up everybody is to face the new opportunities coming out of digital opportunities. So I think all technologies somehow or the other will have something to do with digital part of that. So therefore digitalization of this whole thing is something. So we have a big campaign, Digital India. Mm -hmm. In fact, I as a minister of railway started to use digital ideas to reach out to the people. Six billion people who travel by train every year, they make complaints while they're still traveling and we try to address those complaints while they are still on travel. So that's something which we try to do. So I think there are many opportunities, challenges as I said, but challenges have to be overlooked as other uh, went to addressed only by developing better technology. So I'm not saying no technology is a solution to challenges. Mm -hmm. The solution is how to make better technologies, keeping in mind these two broad aspects of environment and society. So John, then in that case, if I turn to you, you're building a thousand locomotives over the next 10 years for India. Uh, you're going to set up a manufacturing unit. Um, and as you were telling me earlier, you, you know, it's going to hopefully be a whole ecosystem around that setup. What new technologies are going to feature there? Can you give us some examples as you, as you develop this new generation of rolling stock? Well, we've, we've put a, a couple hundred million dollars into a facility in Pune, which demonstrates a version of what we will do in, uh, in Bihar when we produce locomotives. It's, it's fully digital, so you won't find a piece of paper. Uh, you know, we've, we're converging design and manufacturing engineering because that's going to reduce the cycle time and the ability to bring better designs that are more manufacturable right to the shop floor. And, and this point you make about the ecosystem, I mean, and the minister knows this very well, you, you know, there tends to be a focus on the amount of money you're going to spend and the number of people you're going to hire initially. But what's really important, I mean, that's, that's not unimportant. What's really important is the, this ecosystem that you build around training and skills development, uh, suppliers, working capital for suppliers. You have to have all of that if this facility is going to produce 100 locomotives a year that, that he wants to buy and export. Because that is the standard. If, when we're exporting from this facility, we will know that we've achieved a global standard, and that has to be our goal. But, but if you don't do the ecosystem, which never really gets focused on in the beginning, then we'll squeeze 100 locomotives out a year. Uh, our customer may be satisfied, but the potential of the facility won't be realized. So we can't be happy with that. If I could turn to you, Pranay. So we're talking about building an ecosystem with railways, but we're also one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, is building new platforms, uh, whole new systems on which new technologies can function. You run a platform effectively in a new sector, cabs. Um, how, what are the challenges you face in introducing a new platform in what's an age-old industry? I mean, people hailing transport to get from A to B. How does that work? And what are the challenges you face? What, what are the barriers that you have to cross to make that work efficiently? And what barriers do you face still? So I think uh, to start off, uh, uh, the, the value of platform is something that we all agree on. I'll, I'll just recap that. Uh, like uh, we saw in the video as well, uh, it, it, it's more about changing who you are than changing what you do. And it, it's a behavior change that is driven by platform more often than not. And uh, the day, I mean, the way you consume data, the way you consume information, products, and services, and the way you create those are something which transform and enable a lot more people and move away from, from a restricted environment where you need a lot of ecosystem support to kind of run through it. On uh, coming specifically to the transportation platform that we have, uh, I think uh, uh, it's, it's a phenomenal example of what technology can do to revolutionize you know the, the existing uh, intra-city commute and now intercity commute that's that's available it's basically utilizing the same uh, asset and inventory which was idle and uh, connecting the two in terms of improving the utilization making it more convenience for the user and bringing a lot of control and a sense of control keeping a feedback mechanism in loop so some of the key challenges like you asked uh, 
uh, that we face is uh, or we have faced in the past uh, i think number one is to get a critical mass uh, in order to you know realize the true potential of the platform uh, it's it's really essential to scale it up fast and then once you once you reach to a threshold scale which is relevant in our case is the number of consumers and the number of drivers or cabs in a city then it kind of multiplies organically with 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 very less effort and that is where the community starts you know contributing to the platform both by consuming it and expanding it so uh, just a case in point is about two years back five years back getting a cab on, on the tap of your button was was not imagined about two years back getting a cab in 15 minutes was was a wow and today if you see a cab which is 10 minutes away you say oh it's, it's still 10 minutes yeah. away so uh, that that's just so that's the kind of behavior change that it drives and uh, so that's that's one challenge uh, that I see. The second challenge is uh, the way the industry is evolving. It's it's fairly new and it's it's kind of uh, evolving pretty fast. And it's essential that the all the players in the ecosystem kind of understand and consume it the way it is and with with the right set of governance from all stakeholders. It's it's important to build a platform which which co-opts and leverages technology to whatever is available offline uh, in the same space. So I think that's something that we are on it and uh, we're trying to you know, get into the autos and the Kali Peelis are already on the platform. Uh, the next phase that we see, uh, where we see, see some bit of a challenge is how do we solve the problem of multimodal kind of a transportation system where you kind of connect uh, from point A to point B, which is not just in city to anywhere uh, within India. So th these are the key challenges that we have seen in the past and the, the key opportunities I would say that we have in front of us. So these are technologies that are sectors where new technologies are being implemented and, and you know, using digitization and so on. But what about quantum computing, which, what, can you begin by explaining to us quickly what it is and, 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 and what can it do for a country like India? Sure, so back in the early 1980s, Richard Feynman envisioned quantum computers. And what this entailed was taking the bits in classical computers and replacing them with quantum bits, known as qubits. And qubits are really just bits that purposefully take advantage of quantum mechanics. If you fast forward to today, we've seen many different paradigms of quantum computing actually appear with groups like Microsoft, Google, IBM, and D-Wave all bringing their own unique flavor to the table. But what's exciting for practitioners is quantum computers are good at solving particular classes of problems that classical computers struggle with. And today's current quantum computers are good at solving optimization and sampling problems. Um, examples of these can be seen throughout industry and throughout society, and often they're some of the most difficult problems, but they're dressed up in disguise, and they really at their core optimization problems. So for example, if you look at life sciences and pharmaceuticals, an area where India is one of the largest players by volume, we see examples like development of biologics, genetic analysis, protein folding, and things of that nature, all having optimization at their core. And if we shift gears to manufacturing, which is something we're talking about right now, we see problems like job shop scheduling, network analysis, and dynamic allocation of assets. Again, another critical industry to India. And if you want to shift gears and think a little bit about the finance sector, another major global economy, we see things like portfolio construction, asset allocation, and tax strategies, all as examples of optimization problems. However, what people are most excited about for quantum computers and where they show real promise is in machine learning, because again, at its core, machine learning really is an optimization and a sampling problem. Harman Nevin, who's one of the directors at Google's Quantum Artificial Intelligence Lab, actually predicts that within one decade, we'll only be doing quantum machine learning. And this is a really, really important point, because already today, we've seen vast application of machine learning, and we've really just scratched the surface of what's going to be possible in the future. Critical examples of this already include things like self-driving cars, industrial robots, 3D printing, cancer diagnosis, drug development, and many other applications in healthcare. And I think these are particularly pertinent to India's uh, economy and country because you have very substantial complex problems like how do I deliver healthcare to 1.3 billion people and how do I monitor or digitize my manufacturing sector and stay competitive? And what we've seen in the past is as new computational capabilities come online, they really rise the tide on what's possible for all other areas of technological development. So as we go through the fourth industrial revolution, it's going to be important to keep your eye on these new paradigms and things like quantum computing. So, Minister, as, as these new technologies arrive, John's building an ecosystem, we're talking about a platform, um, it requires, are you, is there a risk, do you think, that technology sometimes runs ahead of regu regulation and policy? 
you know, you've got these things emerging and you have to quickly catch up. How big a challenge is that for a policymaker like you? You know, in fact, uh, the role of government in technology is very limited. Of course, important, but yeah. very limited. It is limited to the extent of enabling people to come out with their own ideas, allow an ecosystem to be created because, you know, you can't, uh, you have to have everything in place at the same time and they must be able to connect with each other properly. So that's why we need a proper policy support for that. I think uh, we are really gearing up for that. You must have noticed in the last few years, there are many startups which have come up in India. And it doesn't happen that, you know, you cannot uh, decide from uh, the 10th of October, we are going to launch an ecosystem which is in place. It doesn't happen like that. It evolves and therefore it develops and this is how it should happen. Otherwise, uh, it, every country would have created a Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. You know, if this was the case, they would just take, create something. It is not a Disneyland so that you can take it from one place to another and start doing that. So therefore, we must uh, allow that to happen and that's the progression which takes place. And I think we are really on the right track to make that happen. And there are many other things which are also necessary. Of course, the capital is very important mm -hmm. and the right kind of capital. Yeah. It should be angel capital, risk capital, which really is necessary for it to come in at the right time again. Because probably the risk capital will come only when the risk is over. That's not risk capital. So I think something that has should happen at the right time. So that is an uh, institutional issue. So that again needs to be addressed. There are maybe some taxation issues, which again we are taking care of. So what we really mean by policy is not just one single policy. Sure. There are several things must fall in place and that's what we are trying to do. And it's an evolution which will happen. And I can see something, the Prime Minister himself is leading this, is we had a fantastic program, startup program mm -hmm. in um, Delhi. So hundred thousands of youngsters who came and now we can see that getting into the academics, the education institutions. We launched one of our satellite recently, one of that was launched by the students, something which is unheard of before. So this is a process which takes place. You need to initiate it, provide a policy support and also keep correcting. There is nothing like one single policy which is going to work. Mm -hmm. You have to keep, keep trying and testing and then keep be, so you have to be dynamic in terms of and also proactive in terms of finding out what really goes on. So that's what we are really trying to do. So the minister has given us a broad overview. If I could push you for a specific, you talked about building an ecosystem and the test will be exports. Is there a policies or a set of policies that you think will help spur that? Well, <clears throat> I think the one area where government really can help is in is balancing the need for access. Right. If you think about big data with the sometimes competing needs for privacy and security. And I can't speak to the situation in India, but in many countries there are, there's laws and, and regulation that is attempting to restrict the ability of companies like ours to move data around so that you can take full advantage of the 30,000 jet engines that we monitor in flight every day with this idea that the government of Indonesia doesn't want the data to leave Indonesia. And so, uh, over time, there could be limitations to the value of the big data if you're, in, you know, working with increasingly smaller subsets. Um, but I also want to get back to a point that was discussed in the first round. This, this idea that what, what is happening with the data, we've been monitoring uh, locomotives and jet engines and gas turbines in, in service for 20 years. In the beginning, it was so expensive to move that data around and do something with it, it had limited utility. Today, because of computing power and bandwidth, we can do a lot with it. In computing, the next step for us is going to be the development of a digital twin. So every locomotive that we produce, we will we will we'll have a, cop a digital copy from birth. We'll track every service, every performance incident, everything that happens to that locomotive. So our ability to be very prescriptive, it's the, it's the industrial equivalent to, uh, to personalized healthcare, right? You're gonna, you're gonna know exactly what's happened to a jet engine, a gas turbine, a locomotive, and be that much better at predicting and optimizing performance. And that's, and we're right around the corner.
for that. So we've gone in 20 years from, you know, monitoring our first locomotive to being able to capture and digitize an exact copy of every locomotive. Um, before I go to Pranay, um, could I ask you, so as these technologies come in, so they're going to monitor the locomotives, it's going to affect the jobs of people engaged in doing that today. Somebody does it today, and now a machine will do it, and someone will step in later in the chain. So that doesn't that create a challenge for you with, with, with the new technologies? Because you have to ensure prosperity as you bring in new technologies in your various sector. How do you approach that? This is what I meant when I was mentioning earlier about the societal yeah. issues. Yeah. So that's what I was really saying is, you know, we can, of course, we have seen something very interesting when uh, the railways came into UK for the first time. Mm -hmm. The cart, the, those who were running horse carts were feeling that they will lose jobs. But then they got job, they lost jobs, but they got somewhere else. Okay. But what you're seeing that, that happened during the first industrial revolution. But what you're seeing, particularly in the last decade or so, and particularly all over the world, is something like new economic growth is not adding jobs. And that's something which is of a serious concern to everybody. And not just locomotives which we can tackle in terms of displacement of jobs. Mm -hmm. But what is really happening is the robots which are going to come in a big way. And that is going to really create a huge challenge. Of course, people are saying that we always find a solution to a problem when the problem comes in. Mm -hmm. I think that's one way to look at it is don't trouble trouble until trouble troubles you. Right. But, but you can see the trouble a, coming. Always a good idea. So I think we would rather also look into that aspect of it and look at it. So I think this is a big issue like a big data, what John says, for me is a big problem, is a big job. Yeah. And therefore, we really need to find out how do you actually create those new jobs, which are those new sectors which are going to create. We are working for that in Indian context with skilling programs. We are trying to create more, impart more skills to people so they become more self-employed, they can do more jobs. But at the same time, at a global level, I think, in any case, you can create jobs in a particular geography mm -hmm. for a particular space of time. But if technology comes in and then it becomes, it can displace those jobs as well. So in global context, we really need to find out how we're going to find jobs for these 7 billion people. That's something which we really need to understand that this is a macro, not just macro in the context of a geography. But this is something which we really need to understand from where are they going to come? Because if each Japan develops robots because they have their problem because of uh, the age profile of the population, but they develop technology to take care of that. Can you keep that technology only in the Japanese borders? That is going to spill over to other countries and therefore it's going to create. So therefore, it is not no argument yeah. for not developing new technology. But this is something which we really need to mainstream into looking at policy support that is necessary for development of new technologies and its spin-off benefit on social issue. That's what I mean. Um, what about your platform? So your platform helps create a new kind of job for people who were engaged in the job earlier. But it's a different kind of job, right? Um, and, and how did you, what was the challenge in attracting people to that? So I think uh, uh, what has happened is uh, more convenience has increased the overall entropy of the system if I talk at a macro level. And uh, the need to commute is, is more of utilitarian now as against a, a luxury or an opportunity, be it a cab or a auto or whatever. Uh, what, uh, what this brings in is, is an opportunity to create a lot of employment in form of creating entrepreneurs. And uh, so we have half a million drivers today, more than half a million drivers. And uh, even today, uh, the demand is so humongous in, com uh, as comparison to, in comparison to the supply that we have that we can easily add equally more number of drivers. So that, that gives us a tremendous opportunity to kind of uh, go out in the market uh, and you know, partner with with the relevant stakeholders. Uh, you know, partner with the skill development council and create more jobs. And we are onto it. And that that's something which which is a different kind of a job where uh, you it's not just you know a, a worker kind of a relationship, but it's a partner. Uh, uh, relationship where you make him an entrepreneur, make him buy his car or lease out a car, and uh, create a livelihood for himself. How can big data help? with managing these transitions between the kinds of jobs we've got across industries. How, you know, as people come into new kinds of jobs, so we're going from, say, if someone's a full-time driver employed with, with a 
car company somewhere, you know, at a hotel or something, there might be benefits attached. You know, now he's switching into a more entrepreneurial role, he or she. How, how, how can big data help manage that transition for both the employer and the employee in a place like India especially? Perfect. So thinking of it in context of quantum computing, uh, some of the problems we face that are big data problems also could be big search problems, and quantum computers are very good at dealing with those types of problems. And what I think we're going to see is, as quantum computers mature, there's going to be a huge surge for jobs and people who can program those types of systems. And today, because it's a relatively new field, there's actually very few people in the world with that skill set. I think this presents a tremendous opportunity for India as a country because it has a very large IT-savvy workforce and a very young population. And by engaging early in education around things like big data, machine learning, quantum computing, they really could take a leadership role and leapfrog some of the other places in the world. Um, so I think from a big data perspective, if you look at what's coming out of John's engines and out of the different uh, user apps and things like that, we're going to find solutions that we couldn't have imagined earlier. And in terms of education, you can already access all of these things online very easily if you want to learn about it. There are software development kits, there's simulators, there's educational documentation, all in common programming language people understand like Python and C++. And in the context of quantum computing, you're actually going to see it accessible via the cloud as a utility in a very similar way to what you would see already with classical systems. Think of something akin to say an AWS. And when you take these things combined, you'll see that for very little upfront cost, Indian entrepreneurs can start delivering machine learning and quantum services today. And if you take that up one more level, it's actually not difficult for major multinational corporations and Indian corporations to start understanding where you could apply these technologies and working with these Indian entrepreneurs. So if you step back and you think about it, you've got a very large workforce who are IT savvy, you have a new crop of entrepreneurs, you have a corporate environment where people are learning how to apply these problems, and then if you have uh, support through government policy for education, India really could take a lead in this area. And if you think about who's actually been successful in this area to date, it's still very, very limited. And if you look at the countries pursuing this right now, you'll see Canada, the US, the UK, uh, the European Union starting to invest heavily in building out their country's capabilities for quantum computing. However, there's no reason why India's name shouldn't be on that list. And in fact, IT services is already one of India's largest exports, and with its rapidly growing workforce, it really should be one of the leaders in the space. So, Landon talks about the development of skills. Um, as you build your ecosystem, how big a challenge for you is it, as you bring in new technologies, finding skilled people in, it, India, in the Indian context specifically? Well, I mean, it's, it, globally, it's a challenge. We spent a billion dollars on training globally. <laughs> Uh, it's both a challenge and an opportunity because we see the world as our oyster. We operate in 180 countries. We do manufacturing and service, and you know we've got employees located in all of them. And so we like to think that we're a kind of a global conduit. And we're 18,000 people in India, 6,000 engineers working on stuff that helps us all over the world. So. India is a perfect place for us, and, and half of what we build here gets exported. So we prove that we can compete from an Indian base. But, but I, I want to talk about something that I think the fourth industrial revolution misses a little bit, and that is the importance of dealing with the dislocation. Every industrial revolution, however many we've had over yeah. time, brings with it dislocation. It has to. I mean, and you look at what, what, what car services are doing. I mean, my kids graduated from high school in the United States. The first thing they wanted to do is buy a car. Now they, they live in Chicago and Baltimore, and Uber is their car, right? So the market is changing. General Motors and Ford can resist that, or they can embrace it and try to figure out how to create a different form of utility, right? So the, the question for countries and companies, because we're part of it too, is, is how do you recognize the dislocation? Is it reskilling, repurposing, retraining, mm -hmm. different forms of capacity building? Because that's what you're going to need, and you can't have your head in the sand because it will happen. Uh, we've got visual technology now that you can use to inspect tracks. So, so typically around the world, tracks, railroad tracks are, are inspected manually. People go along, uh, but over time. 
you, you end up with problems, the sun, the heat, they buckle, and you can have a derailment. That's, that's going to be done digitally. You're going to have cameras on the front of trains. They're going to they're know within a millimeter whether the track is, is, is out of sequence. There's no need, there will be no need for manual mm -hmm. inspections. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, right? Those people who are doing that now can be repurposed, can be retrained, you know? You don't want to avoid that technical development. Mm -hmm. You just need to recognize that with it comes the need to move people around and get them prepared to do something else. Do you think there's a recognition of that among policymakers? Not enough. And you know, I, eternal no, vigilance of how, it's, how technology is changing these things? Not enough. And, it's, and, it's, and, I, and I think companies and countries can do more. Okay. okay? I, think, I, think, I think we have a role to play as we reallocate and restructure, and every company does this. Uh, we need to help repurpose and retrain people who are affected by that. I'm wondering what you think, Pranay, because car services came up. Do you think there is, do you think there's enough of a recognition of the fact that new technologies, as much as they help a lot of people in many ways, they also change things in all kinds of ways, affect jobs, affect livelihoods, affect the way we think about work. Do you think there's a recognition of that, both among companies and policymakers, just posing the same question to you? Yeah, I think uh, that there's, there's a reasonable appreciation and acknowledgement of, of the new technology, the value that it brings in, and uh, the, the, the evolution that it's going through, and the kind of uh, 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 government or regulation which is or the framework which is required to you know kind of enable this further and and create more jobs and create more value in the in the complete ecosystem so i think uh, that there's a fair recognition and uh, talking about us specifically uh, i think uh, both at the center and the state level the governments are you know uh, figuring out what could be the right framework and i think this is something that's going to be coming out very soon um, Minister, you talked a little bit about this earlier, but you know, the first industrial revolution, you talked about how they horse carts, they found new jobs. In India though, the difference, isn't there a difference in that you just have so many more people? You have many, many more people. Many of them are very, very young. Um, and, and the pressures they pose are quite unique, are they not? How does that affect the policy making framework when we talk about policy makers having to recognize these changes that are taking place? That's why I'm saying we are probably uniquely placed in terms of addressing this challenge, which is really a big one for the whole world, but particularly for the country. Mm -hmm. And therefore, of course, uh, I, I personally feel that we should not have population growing indefinitely, uh, believing that it's going to give us a demographic dividend, because demographic dividend will come for a particular time. So I think particularly now, what we really need to do is to create new opportunities for them. That's why this big program of scaling. But one more thing uh, which has happened during the last few years, and that is something which uh, was development of global supply chains, which is something which is a very interesting development which happened during the last two, three decades. And that's how com companies could outsource to Southeast Asia develop because Japan was developing, then China was developing. That also helped Southeast Asia to develop. I think over a period of time, I'm not so sure whether this new revolution, which is inevitably going to happen, how far they will rely on these global supply chains because mm -hmm. of so many other considerations going beyond economics. Because we can see now the new geopolitical challenges coming up. We probably could see a disruption into this coming out of so many challenges. If that happens, not necessarily on account of economic reason as I said for something else, it could create huge challenges for a country which was thriving because though they were not necessarily developing a new technology, mm -hmm. but they were part of a global supply chain, nonetheless they were benefiting more in terms of jobs because obviously the technology holder was benefiting from IP and the other one were benefiting from doing a little less value-added jobs. So I think that's something which also has to be taken on board. So I think we are certainly gearing up for this in terms of uh, making this young population making stand on their own feet, becoming making them self-employed. My own example, we, we run a small NGO, we are trained almost about 100,000 people mm -hmm. and made them self-employed. Right. And that's um, over the last one and a half decade. And they, most of them are women. I mean, they would never venture out of place because my constituency 
a bit for my which is a huge problem in India because labor participation yes. among so women is very very that's low. That's another issue. Yeah, it's not just finding employment to young people, mm -hmm. but finding out on the gender issues, particularly yeah. for the it's women, and therefore uniquely placed jobs have to be created for women because mm -hmm. not necessarily because they are women, but because in society in rural areas they have to also take care of certain other household issues. Mm -hmm. So they have to run a family. So they cannot work as the others can work going out for a long period of time. So we must be able to find jobs nearer to their home, something which they can do while they also take care of their household responsibilities. Something like this is also going to be a very interesting issue. So I'm saying, that's what I was coming back to my old point, of societies change, not they are not same societies globally. Mm -hmm. So we cannot find a global solution to such local issues. At the same time, it is also necessary to look at these issues as a global challenge. And I think World Economic Forum keeps giving advisory about how much more GDP is going to be added, etc. I think this is a good time WF start thinking about where are going to be the new jobs coming up? Right. What are the new opportunities coming up? How are they going to be taken and how people can take advantage of that? Something like this will be a more value added. I think that could be really something more relevant too. So I think before we have the fourth industry revolution, I think we can have a new series of advisories coming from WF about the job opportunities. All right. Well, there's an idea. Um, so I'm going to open this up to questions uh, for the panel. Um, let's start on this side of the room. Yeah, please. Hi. I was just, uh, I wanted to have a question or something to think about between Mr. Rice and uh, Minister. For all the locomotives that he's manufacturing for you, what is the task you can give a company like GE to say, all the data which is to be analyzed of these locomotives that he's just talked about could be jobs that could be created by training people in some rural locations, you know, more other provinces, other areas, to make sure that you tie up certain quota of data analysts, jobs be created for the amount of machines that you create, you know, which work for you in this country. So the other point was, I, we didn't discuss about the 60-70% of the Indian population who are rural and agricultural. And what does this revolution do for us to really revolutionize the agriculture, leveraging, of course, the, the technological advancements and disruptions, which is industrial in that sense, so that India actually can have inclusive growth. And we can also get them included using technology and modernized agriculture. And the third point of John and somebody like that was to say, you know, what are you doing about uh, training hundreds of thousands of Indians to move away from the contact center, customer support, BPO, to becoming data analysts in the future? Because the human capital that we have today can be leveraged for the G's of the world for outsourcing data analysis work and creating employability for our people who are the educated or who can be trained or educated for employability in the data analysis space. Thank you. So, so, if, so as I understand it, so would you tie specific jobs to specific, you know, specific quotas that if you come and do this and bring these new technologies, you have these many jobs? We talked about data analysts, but just to broaden that out a little bit. See, this whole exercise, as I said, of skilling people is essentially aimed at that. We are creating district by district the profile of what opportunities could be created there. And also, on the other hand, we are trying to find out, for particularly for that local district, local situation, how can the people be trained into that particular discipline. And that's an ex ex extremely important exercise which is already on the way. We have created first time in India as an, under the Prime Minister, new ministry, which is essentially doing exclusively this job. Now, in terms of agriculture, in fact, today, what is the opportunity for, a, what is an exit route for a farmer? There's no exit route. So therefore, if you can actually, and anywhere in the world, we have seen that this has happened, this is a particular, that is what the revolution is all about, is allowing people to migrate from the agriculture to something else. Even in China, same thing happened. And people say this was even bigger long march than the long march of Mao itself, when the people migrated from villages into rural, from rural areas into factories, from farm to factories in the biggest way. So our opportunity here is, how can we, because there are anyway more number of people on agriculture than what they are, so there is a disguised employment. It is really not employment. So therefore what we are trying to do is to allow them 
to learn skills which will enable them to leave farm and try to do something as close as possible to the place where they live to also solve and mitigate a problem which will come out of urbanization when people migrate in such large number to the areas like this so this is exactly what we are trying to do but of course as i said it is something which again cannot just happen only on skill alone we really need a proper industrial activity and that's why we are working on make in india campaign so this fourth industrial revolution hopefully will also create opportunities of the kind that are necessary befitting the local situation that prevails in a country like india and therefore that's something which we really constantly keep upgrading ourselves to find out how that can happen but the whole exercise is essentially aimed at allowing people to move from a better opportunities because on farm there are many people working on a small holding so therefore they are not making enough money and that's why there is a problem so if you can move about say 40% of the people from farm to new opportunities in skilling and other places obviously to that extent the pressure on land will go down because the 40% people will don't have to rely on the earning from the land alone and that's what we really are trying to do. Uh, since that was also addressed to you how can companies help with that you're going to go to bihar which is mostly rural well better locomotives will help food get to the market before they before it spoils so that's a that's a good thing uh, we're not in bihar by accident we're in bihar because the rail ministry said this is where we want you to do this so we can handle prescriptive requests right that's i think one of the benefits of working with companies that have scale and capability so we can do that and your your third point about uh, the digital work that we do in country you should you should talk to the guy sitting in front of you he runs bangalore and that's where we're starting to do some of that work so it is possible to do it in india certainly uh, how rural you can get with stuff like that depends if you can find people who are qualified to do it right so that's the the match that has to be made will the see the fourth industrial revolution big data will it drive out small enterprises will it create monopolies which are so big that they will influence how people vote like facebook and twitter and can that be allowed to happen and that's what i think so should be worrying the minister also going forward because how could 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 these big enterprises be blackmailing the public system the the democracies of smaller countries and that's a question um can i ask you that question are you going to become too big and blackmail the rest of us <laughs> so i think uh, uh that is uh, uh so the, the the fact that it's a platform and and it's the the real stakeholders are the consumers and 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 the people who are actually providing services so uh, to that angle uh, it it's something which which will be a sustainable long term thing and and beat any platform for that matter so long as it 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 creates more jobs it creates more value it creates more convenience and gives more control to both the stakeholders on both the sides of the platform i think uh, that's not going to be a challenge more about you lanton what do you think as as ever more powerful forms of technology like quantum computing arrive is there a risk that too much power is concentrated in one company in one sector that can maybe master data better than others and so on i think a lot of the innovation is seen actually at the hands of the entrepreneur and a good example of this is as a website called kaggle which runs machine learning competitions and what happens is companies um very large venerable companies post their data and say hey can you do a better job than what we're doing and then these different data scientists compete for it and what they found is most of the competitions are won handily by these data scientists they have no background in the industry and they get it done within a matter of a week or two and often beating teams of you know 20 30 50 people who have been at it for 10 20 years so i think a lot of the innovation still can rest with the individual and maybe a question is do those individuals all get gobbled up by the larger corporations as time passes but i think a lot of the stuff really really is well distributed at least in the beginning so it probably comes down to large companies abilities to actually aggregate these individuals another question yeah i want to move to this side in a sec after this one of the things which you talked about in the fourth re industrial revolution is the lot of startups now it's very important you know we talk about the success stories in the startups 
but we forget about how many people fail. And I would like to comment on this, that collegians, straight from college, going into business, are likely not to succeed. It's unfortunate, but they need experience. They need more knowledge. They need more age. They need mentoring, etc., etc. In order to avoid failures as much as possible, I think these startups need a certain maturity, a certain age to get into those startups. Because, you know, just now, I've been hearing from the morning, oh, the collegians are all gung-ho about startups. That's not the way, according to me. What does the minister and other panelists think? Okay, about? I'm going to get another question before, and then we can address them together. Yeah. Do we have a mic? I really want to ask the panel on what do they think about gender parity in the fourth industrial revolution? We've actually seen, at least in India, men dominate computer sciences, mathematics, engineering fields. What are some of the new opportunities for women in the fourth industrial revolution? And another from here, and then we can, yeah. Um, my question is uh, 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 what, uh, the, regarding the point that was made that we won't be needing manual uh, rail inspectors, uh, the, the, the track inspectors. But my question is our school education system is actually still producing factory workers and still producing the manual rail inspectors um, who are going to be growing up and then we'll be needing them uh, to be skilled. So the idea is if the school education is uh, uh, worked upon, there's a radical change that is required in India. That's what at least a lot of people, in, like we work in the rural segment, so I, I go to the schools and work with them. We shouldn't be needing skilling in 10 years. We are still making them, we are still thinking making PDF files available online is going to make them ready, the act, actual active participants of the fourth industrial revolution. You know, that's the school children. So, so my question to the minister is, you know, uh, from the government perspective, is the radical change in education coming? Because if that's not going to come, we're going to miss out on all the points that we're talking about. Okay. Well, Minister, if we start with you, with the gender question, just bundling it up, the, the you know, we had, we're talking about how we keep up our skills education with where technology is going and so on. It has to keep up with the changes. And as you change it, you also have to make sure that you, that you ensure that women who have, as I said earlier, very low labor participation, also low participation in the education sector, that they come in in bigger numbers. How do you do the two things? You know, see, this is the, not such a difficult thing to accomplish because this is something which we are actually trying to do. Do you have an example, in, say? In India, particularly, this is exactly what is our affirmative action actually aiming at. So this is something which we are really working on these issues. So this is not something which is, of course, People would then say, oh, you are doing it, where is the result? I think this is something which I wish the new industrial revolution, maybe fifth, will try to create result before we begin action. So I think that's something will be very good. But I think till such time that we have that revolution, we'll have to first begin action and then only we'll get result. So we are working on each of these areas and therefore we'll wait for the results to come in the next few years' time. On my good friend Shekhar's point, which is something which is right, that there are many failed and only few succeed. But if you really look at it, I'm not trying to make a value judgment, but I'm just looking at it, just thinking myself a little loudly, is that's the law of nature. Every plant doesn't survive. If that was the case, every animal which is born doesn't survive. So this is how it is. So I think, and if at all, everybody were going to survive, I don't know what's going to happen. And that's one of the issues that we deal when we talk about biotechnology, incidentally, is something like this, that if everything survives, the proliferation of it, and what it really means to ecology, broadly. So, but point is well taken to reduce failures. What is that we should try to do in terms of making sure, because that's again, is a precious capital, precious time that we spend on it. And that's why point is well taken. And I think that's something which will again try and learn over a period of time. But the point is, the startups are ones who are by nature are thinking something which in the absence of ecosystem may cause a failure. That's also a possibility. Sometimes, and you are thinking so much ahead of time that people might think, oh, please, 
I, I, if you are thinking like this, I could have thought about it. Why? You can only think about it. So I'm challenging him, not because his thinking is wrong, but because I think, why I could not think the same idea before him? And that's what I want to bring it down. So I think that's something which is inevitable, but we must therefore have an open system wherein nobody will be able to put that idea down to make him fail deliberately so that others don't succeed. So that's something which we really need to do. If the goal is to prepare people for a 35-year career that doesn't change, you're going to fail. You've got to prepare people for lifelong learning because the job, I mean, who can predict what, you know, 2040 is going to look like? And so if you don't have flexibility in terms of how people think about preparing themselves and those that work with them, you, you will fail. And I think that's, we have to do that and countries have to do that. And the other point I would make on diversity is it's coming. I mean, we, I mentioned briefly the facility we have in Pune, uh, over 1,000 people work there, 25% of the workforce is women. Uh, we hire women from the local universities. They start on the shop floor in our operations management, and they set a standard for us. They're, they're, there's no question in my mind that that women in this country are going to have more and more opportunities, and companies like ours are going to love to have them. As a startup that's succeeding, how, what are you doing to address these issues? I think uh, uh, what is essential is, uh, um, obviously, like uh, Minister said, it's, it's only a few startups who probably succeed, and the definition of success is something that we see as an outcome. Uh, but uh, what what goes within is is a tremendous learning experience, whatever you do, and uh, what is essential is how do we promote and enable the application of that in whatever he or she is doing next. Uh, that that is one, and uh, the the second part is uh, like again something that minister said: how do we create a more uh, conducive and more uh, enabling ecosystem to promote this spirit and this mindset change of you know creating something which which can potentially. Uh, constructively disrupt uh, what, what is happening, uh, be it on the digitization front, be it on uh, bringing in more efficiencies and what is available. And uh, just just uh, coupling this point with, with uh, the question that we had on this side, I think the education system is, is something which uh, needs to be slightly tweaked and uh, I'm sure it's not that easy. I mean, it's me saying that it's, it's, it's very simple, but I think uh, there are people who are on it and have already started seeing some of it, especially in the colleges where you have now courses on, on startups, entrepreneurship, uh, how do you change your mindset in terms of uh, you know the attitude that you carry and not just about skilling and the and the capabilities that you learn in terms of doing a job so i think that that's a long term change in my personal view which which is happening and and it's it's good on its trajectory great uh, and with that i've just been told i have to call this to an end so thank you everyone uh, for addressing this great topic and thank you to the audience for the questions